Before we get started, on behalf of BCS, we'd like to take a moment to offer a brief land acknowledgement. BCS Baltimore Center Stage is located on the ancestral and occupied lands of the Piscataway peoples, the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. These lands have also been cared for by the Lenape, Lumbee, and Susquehannox people, and many indigenous nations who are still here today. We pay respects to their elders past, present, and future. Thank you all. Um, so as you can tell, we're co-hosting tonight. <laughs> this is the first time that we have co-hosted the Baltimore Butterfly Sessions. Like ever. <laughs> and we are delighted to welcome you all here. The theme for tonight is the future of labor. You all may or may not know, but today is May 1st, which is International Workers' Day. Tonight, we will celebrate the historic wins of organized labor practi practices and ruminate on what dignified work looks like. So tonight you'll hear a keynote from Bakari Jones from Impact Hub. They'll also invite discussion about your insights on the future of labor here in Baltimore. You'll hear readings of cultural and historical texts, um, which some of our audience members have already agreed to do. Uh, we're so excited to have them. And th these texts have, were especially curated for tonight and were heavily influenced by suggestions from Dr. Lawrence Brown of Morgan State University, who you may know is the author of uh, The Black Butterfly, which this whole series is named for. You'll also hear music tonight from Radical Evolution and their brand new musical Songs About Trains, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later, um, and a special poetry feature by Baltimore's own Kenneth Something, who I can't wait to introduce to you a little bit later. Um, he's gonna be sharing two new poems that we sp uh, specially commissioned just for tonight. It's am yeah. what an amazing lineup. Yeah, <laughs> Did know. we do can it? We it yeah, can we give it up for our amazing lineup? <laughs> Y'all are in for such a treat. And while we're still clapping, while we're still clapping, I'm gonna call up Radical Evolution to get us taken off. So they're gonna come. Hi, my friends. Yeah, let's still clap. It's my first time to be in Baltimore. Oh. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Alrighty. All right. Let's just play it. Okay. Oh, okay. I guess I would say, um, <laughs> I guess I would say, uh, this is probably one of our most, one of the more familiar songs in the show. So if you are, if you do recognize it and you want to sing along, you're more than welcome to. We'll say that. Do we introduce ourselves? Uh, no? No. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards. <laughs> Bye. 
Recuerdo aquel ayer en que solo me quedé cuando vi que te alejabas en el tren. Hacia ti quise correr, hacia ti quise gritar, solo apenas tuve un llanto para ti. so much for that fantastic start to the evening. Um, I can't wait to tell you all more about Songs About Trains, but before we get to that, I want to invite Kenneth something up to the mic. Um, Kenneth, I, I mentioned, is going to be sharing two, oh dear, two new poems specially uh, commissioned for tonight, but before I bring him up here, I want to tell you a little bit about him because he's amazing. Kenneth is an artist, organizer, and educator from here in Baltimore, Maryland for over a decade. Kenneth has worked to create art and institutions that connect and transform people. Most recently, his work centers around marginalized people gaining access to their intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and creative traditions. He's got many accomplishments, including but not limited to, having his art on display at the BMA, publishing two collections of poetry, co-founding Do More Baltimore and the Baltimore Youth Initiative High School, becoming a national poetry slam champion and being a professor at MICA. And he's had the opportunity to teach, work, and live in many places around the country, but Baltimore is his favorite place to create and build. And also he's the co-founder founder of the Charm City Slam, which I just had the opportunity to judge last week. And I just can't wait for him to come up to the stage because I kid you not, anytime Kenneth has a microphone, I'm like, I just, I can't stop watching. He's so good. Um, so Kenneth, come up here and take the mic, please. I need that copy of my bio. I do not know where you got it from, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I want it. Is, I, I, that was impressive. Um, I did not send that to them. I don't, they did some research on me, because that's not what I sent. Um, and it's so much better than what, if I did send anything. I probably didn't send anything, but if I did, that's better. If you just CC me on that next time. All right, hey everyone. So again, um, can I have something? So um, I want to first thank um, center stage for reaching out to invite me to participate in this experience. Um, as a poet, um, we often just wait for inspiration to come along to kind of like decide what we're going to write about. And, um, and often for me, I write from very personal narratives and personal experiences. So I do enjoy the challenge when I'm asked to, you know, a commission to write um, on a subject that I naturally wouldn't have done, right? And so it allows me to learn so much about that subject, um, and it invites me to like still bring my personal narrative to that story. Um, and so this conversation was a challenging, um, fun, and interesting experience, and so I thank you for inviting me to participate in this. All right, here we go, are you ready? Um, before we go, each of you should have, been, should have received a I feel like I'm a magician. This is what magicians be like. Each of you should have received a card. It's like lime, I see some of you with it. Um, does anyone know what a haiku is? Okay, um, I'm not gonna put you on the spot and tell you to, to tell us. Um, oh, you do, you do want to tell? You can do it, you seem like you really do know sincerely. No. Well, I wasn't pointing at you, but you're absolutely right. So, so uh, <laughs> I was, it was a handbag there, but you jumped right in and you, and you intercepted that question and you ran all the way to the end zone, so awesome job. But yes, it is a three-line poem that has 
first line, five syllables, se second line, seven syllables, and then the third line, five again. American haikus decide to say they don't care and they just do other things. So, so the point is, I'm gonna invite you to all write a, sh a short poem, a haiku, about this conversation, right? About labor, about your own personal thoughts and experiences on this subject. Um, and we would love to have those later, right? We wanna collect those from you. So if you have a haiku, I'm gonna read some haikus later, but I want yours too. And if you send it to me on Instagram, I will post them in my stories, and we're gonna be great to say, this is how I spent my day with you all, okay? All right, so before I get to the haikus, because it gives you some time, to, so I think about your 575. Quick poem. Um, I said thank you already, but I also want to say thank you again because one of the people in my life who was really important to me was my grandfather, and I never wrote a poem about him, but it was always on my bucket list. Like, I felt he passed away, but I felt like I never had a chance to write a poem about him, and this, I used this moment to finally do that, and so um, I'm really thankful for that. My grandfather, Emmett, was a railroad man. He built a home out of muscle and bone, never rich, but had enough grit to go and get whatever Nana said she needed in the kitchen. Brought back enough bread to feed a family of five and the neighbors sometimes, and my Uncle Daryl sometimes, and my cousins when they had to crash on the couch, and no matter the pain, my granddad never complained, never said ouch, just got up every morning to put food in our mouth. See, my granddad, Emmett, was from the South came from a family of farmers who never knew a work day to end. They grew strong crops and stronger men. My granddad never met a job. He wasn't willing to work it. His smile never made the job seem easy, but it always made it seem worth it. My granddad Emmett was a railroad man. Built everything I admire with his hands. Shaped my values between dinner and dawn. Between baseball games and bad jokes. I learned how to love and live and work and work and work and work and work. When my granddad died, doctors diagnosed him with cancer. Said it was the exposure to, as to asbestos. Said he got it from working the railroad. The lawyers handed us a check that did not cover the cost of his casket. And since then, I have been wrestling and dancing with unanswered questions like, was all the hard work worth it? Like, what was the purpose? It all seemed to be a contradiction. Like, how can the thing you do for a living be the thing that caused your ending? The thing that allowed you to feed your family be the reason you have to leave your wife. The truth is capitalism is a system that sacrifices many of its members to ensure a few can gain higher percentages. And the truth is we are both the problem and the victim. And despite my understanding of the system, every day I get up and get dressed just like my granddad did. To face a world that demands my work but does not value my worth like my granddad did come home just in time to eat and repeat like my granddad did, eat and repeat like my granddad did, eat and repeat like my granddad did. Sometimes I can see how much of my granddad is in me and how much rare role is in everything that I do. All my life, I've been training for this train, a one-way ticket to an unhappy ending. It's either we are all aboard, or we are all aboard. There is no in between. Poem. All right, so for this next piece is a series of haikus. And what I'm gonna do, I need you to participate in this process, okay? So I'm going to point to you. We, we all know what a haiku is. We've mastered this now at this point. We're all expert haiku writers. We know this. So I'm going to point to you, and you're going to respond with the word haiku. I know we can do this, right? I, I can tell. I can look in your face and know we're capable of this moment. But I'm going to test it, just in case. Never know. Um, OK, see? OK, all right. All right, it's on me. It's on me. That's why I test is important. So let's try this again. I'm going, it was, it was my fault. It was 100% my fault. 
I'm going to point to you, and you're going to say haiku. Okay. Haiku. Almost. Almost did it. So I'm going to say it with you this time. Okay? I'm, just watch. I'm going to like, haiku. You ready? Haiku. 10% of the room was able to participate with this. I'm going to go for 17%. If I can get 17%, the show will go on. Okay? Just 17%. Um, you ready? Haiku. All right, that was the example. We did it. Now it's time for the haikus. Remember what a haiku is, and you're going to write your own. Haiku. In sweatshops they toil, long hours for meager pay, exploited labor. Haiku. Solidarity. Strikes and pickets in the streets. Workers fight for rights. Haiku. Steel mills and coal mines, dangerous but must provide for our families. Haiku. Minimum wage blues, can't afford to pay the rent, can't afford to live. Haiku. Overtime galore, working long hours, no break, but time is money. Haiku. Gig economy, freelance work and side hustles, no security. Immigrants come here in search of better life. Labor fuels the dream. Haiku. Labor of love, too. Caregivers, nurses, and more. Undervalued work. Haiku. Retirement creeps. Longer work life. Short on rest. The golden years fade. Haiku. Automation looms. Robots and machines replace. Workers lose their jobs. Haiku. All right, so those was a series of haikus. Did y'all did follow? You write your own? You got that? It was, see how simple it was? All right, so um, not that simple. I mean, it was, okay. Um, fair enough. So y'all, yours are going to be even better, right? You're going to write your, yours. Um, but before I move any further, um, when thinking about this subject, it was a lot of places I could go when trying to think about labor in this, in this country. Um, and the thing that I thought stood out the most to me is imagining where we would be in, in a world where technology takes over and like, what does that mean for labor? So I decided not to write the haikus. Every haiku I just read to you was written by AI. Um, and so I allowed AI to write all the poems that we just experienced. And I decided to actually only write one poem for one haiku only. And this is my haiku. One day the poet will be but an artifact, the last museum. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, you're so tall and so talented. Let's give it up for Kenneth something. So good, not the AI writing all those poems. I was grunting up here and snapping too. Wow, I, I just like have to take a moment. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, now I want to invite up my volunteer readers. Don't worry folks, they've already volunteered. They're gonna come up here and we're gonna get in line so that we can start moving into some civic texts. Um, this moment, is a constellation of three texts that is meant to move us along to the next station of thought. Did, did you guys see what I did there? It's a, it's a train joke because we're so inspired by songs about trains by radical evolution. Our musical guests, who Annalisa will tell you a little bit about. But if my volunteers could come up here to our lovely podium, that'd be lovely. These texts are cultural artifacts that we found here that are heavily influenced by, the wor by Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Lawrence Brown himself. We're gonna go ahead and start actually with an account of the first May Day. If you'd like to come up to this mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's give it up for, my vo uh, for the volunteers, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Daryl Brookins, and I'll be reading an excerpt of From Voices of a People's History, edited by Howard Zinn 
and by Anthony Arnov. On the evening of May 4th, 1886, a meeting was called for Haymarket Square in Chicago to protest the killing of four strikers at the McCormick Harvester Works the day before. It was a peaceful meeting and had dwindled from several thousand to a few hundred when a detachment of 180 policemen asked the crowd to disperse. The speaker said that the meeting was almost over and then a bomb exploded in the midst of the police, wounding 66 policemen, of whom seven later died. The police fired into the crowd, killing several people, wounding two, wounding 200. Although there was no evidence of who threw the bomb, eight Chicago anar anarchists were arrested, tried, and sentenced to death. This became known worldwide as the Haymarket Affair. Four of the eight were executed, among them August Spies, who here addresses the court in his own defense. Just before his execution, Spies said, there will be a time when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. My name is Mikhail Gill. I'll be reading excerpts, excerpt from the end of Burnout, Why Work Drains Us and How to Better Build Lives, a, poem, a book by Jonathan Mailsick. I define burnout as the experience of being pulled between expectation and reality at work. And I argue that burnout is a cultural phenomenon that expanded in the past five decades but that has deep historical roots in our belief that work will be a means not just to a paycheck, but to dignity, character, and a sense of purpose. My name is Jada Mello, and I'll be reading excerpts of excerpt from The Rest is Resistance, a book by Tricia Hers Hersey, the founder of NAP Ministry. Imagine what it would feel like, taste like, and smell like to believe you don't have to prove who you are by your accomplishments and labor. This is at our core of this work. This is at the core of this work and the foundation of imagining a new way. The culture we live under does not point you towards this deep truth. It instead has told you and reinforced the idea that you come into the world to be a machine, to accomplish, to labor, and to do. Nothing can be further from the truth. And when you slowly begin to believe and understand your inherent truth, rest becomes possible in many ways. Thank you. That was amazing, that was amazing. Um, yeah, can we give it up for our volunteer readers one more time? These were audience members, just like you all, and they agreed to come up and be part of the show. So thank you all for, for, for participating in that way. Um, OK, I'm going to invite Radical Evolution back up to the stage. And while they're coming up here, I want to properly intro them. So Radical Evolution is a multi-ethnic producing collective committed to creating artistic events that seek to understand the complexities of the mixed identity existence in the 21st century. Through folk songs from various cultures and imagined letters from those uh, whose stories have been lost to history, Songs About Trains, which is the musical that we're hearing from tonight, welcomes audiences to an exploration of the many cultural communities that built the US railway system. Songs About Trains highlights how this pivotal moment in US history helped forge a global super superpower, generated unbelievable wealth to just a select few, and did so at the expense of thousands of lives, all while inspiring one of the deepest canons of music ever made in this country. Is there more to share about songs about trains or did I kind of do? I feel like I'm just so, I love this musical so much. And like, 
Kenneth's connection to his grandfather. Like, I don't know. I, I know we, we like really kind of did it tonight. And I just want to, I just want to give y'all the opportunity to say a little bit more about it. And I'm going to hop off the stage. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, thank you, Anissa. I mean, yeah, I think one of the most amazing things about it is that connection. And then anytime we work on it, anytime we share music and we play with it, the moment that we talk about it is like, who has connections to the railroad, you know? If the other people in here have connections, there probably are, right? I know my family has it, and we all t oftentimes talk about and share like that idea. And um, the fact that this music was <laughs> connected to it so intimately, and um, a lot of times the music is so beautiful, and I think about the beautiful music that came from labor, mm -hmm. and the beautiful music that came from sweat and blood, and oftentimes sadness and darkness, and it was done with like joy. And I think that that's the thing that I think is a huge part of what we think about at Radical Evolution uh, when we define what we think about as cultural resistance. And I was thinking about the concept of cultural resistance uh, this week because I had the pleasure of uh, being in space with um, one of the former artistic directors of the Freedom Theater, which is a theater company that's based in the occupied territory of Palestine. And he talks about cultural resistance as a way, and one of the main ways he thinks about it is reclaiming history. And that's such a huge part of what we do at Radical Evolution and something that I think is really beautiful about how we reclaim history with music and with art and yeah. celebrate it and celebrate it in solidarity, which I think is such a huge part of it. So let's sing another song yeah. in solidarity yeah. and let's do it. And um, now I think you actually brought this song to us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to tell a little bit about why? Um. <laughs> This song was firstly heard actually through a Mandy pop singer. Um, he was pretty famous, but actually Trace Back was from the early 30s, 50s, mm -hmm. 30s, 40s, 50s, that this is more like a um, folky Taiwanese mm -hmm. actually yeah. songs to something about longing for the lovers mm -hmm. um, that is waiting and the sense of you know longing for the love yeah. and waiting for what's coming. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, part of the, the, the story that we're tying in songs about trains is all the different kinds of communities that help build the railways, um, including you know the many Chinese immigrants. And so this is our way of also paying homage to that tradition. Yeah. Yeah.
so much. Thank you so, so much. Let's give it one more time up for that beautiful, beautiful rendition. Thank you so much, Mao. Um, uh, and now it is my pleasure to invite Bakari Jones up to the mic. Uh, while they're coming up, I'm just gonna share a bit more about them. Bakari is a cultural consultant based in Baltimore, Maryland. Bakari's work centers traditionally marginalized communities, including black, women, LGBTQ, and non-gender non-conforming communities. Black feminist thought, black liberation, theology, and black joy as a mantra of resistance and influence, Bakari's approach to storytelling, facilitation, coaching, and consulting. Bakari also serves as the Empower Baltimore Program Manager at Impact Hub. The Empower Program is sponsored by GoDaddy and helps create micro-businesses and those uh, develop their, and update their websites. Let's give it up for Bakari, y'all. Thank you for being here. So I love you too, oh my gosh. Thank you all for having me. Good evening, good evening. My name is Bakari Jones. Uh, I am a facilitator as he just mentioned, a public speaking coach and the Empower Program Manager at Impact Hub. Um, a little bit about my story and kind of the journey that I've taken, the railroad maybe that I've, anyway. Um, I tried, I tried. Uh, I started as a black studies, specifically African American studies major at Temple. And shortly after I finished undergrad, I had the opportunity to go to post Katrina New Orleans and volunteer through the AmeriCorps VISTA program, which stands for Volunteers in Service to America, where I opted to live below the poverty level um, to learn what it was like uh, for folks. And what I realized, I was like, oh, this isn't very different from the experience that I was already experienced. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is just a paid program to do so. Anyway, my experience in New Orleans was transformative. It was beautiful. And shortly after being in New Orleans for a few years, working, uh, I had the opportunity to work at um, the Amistad Research Library and catalog some of the work of Elizabeth Catlett. I had the opportunity to also work at a micro business um, of a woman named Sandra Berry who was transitioned, um, who had a, basically a traveling art gallery. She visited community artists, would take their work, uh, pick up their work, and basically shop it around to different businesses in the city of New Orleans. Um, shortly after, I moved back to Baltimore and decided to pursue a master's in business administration because I was fascinated by entrepreneurship, and I still am. And that sort of journey has weaved me, or I guess the, that road has, has led me to being the Empower Program Manager at Impact Hub. And so a couple fun facts about labor I don't know if you all know, but a small business can be anywhere from, have anywhere from 100 to like 1,500 employees. So small for some people is large for others. And the program that I manage that's sponsored by GoDaddy, they define a micro business owner as someone that has 10 employees or less. Um, and the average US county has 3.7 micro business owners for every 100 people. Okay, 3.7 for every 100. Baltimore has 9.6 micro businesses for every 100 people. So if you do the quick math, that's two and a half times the national average. So when we think about, I always like to say, when I think about Baltimore and I think about the sort of charm city with the little unique grit, it's not something that's imagined, it's real in that we have more sort of the mom and pop sort of businesses, you know, the one-off shops, food spots that you want to go to that make Baltimore really unique. Um, the other sort of interesting tidbit is that 58% of those micro businesses, um, and I'm not gonna ask y'all to remember any of those stats, so please relax, but 58% of those are considered solopreneurs, right? So they're not, you know, two, three, four, that's literally just one person doing all of the labor, right? They're doing all of the marketing, the research, providing whatever the service is, they're doing it all, they're a one-stop shop. Another fun fact, it's projected that in 2027, 86.5 million people will be freelancing in the United States. Number-wise, that is 50.9, I'm going to round up because I think we're close. So 51% of the U.S. workforce is expected to be a freelancer. So whether that's full-time or part-time, you're expected to be 51%, right? So half of this room right now 
we would say are freelancers. What's the big deal? Why does that matter? So one, increased cost of benefits. I don't know if anybody, anybody in the room freelance now? Freelancers, show some love. Those taxes, right? And then the other piece, there's no unemployment. There's no safety net, right? So what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Just want to sort of put that on the shelf. The other tidbit uh, that I wanted to talk about this evening, as I started contemplating the future of labor, I have sort of referred to this in my mind as out with the boomers and in with the bots, right? So <laughs> Kenneth had a beautiful segue for us um, about AI, the role of AI, right? We know that the baby boomers, that massive segment of the population is on their way out of the workforce, right? Are they gonna be replaced by AI? We don't know, um, but it's something to think. I think it's something that's worth thinking about. The other piece that you know, technology, AI is only one part of technology, right? The other part is that technology enables the sort of gig economy. So when you think about Fiverr and TaskRabbit, even Craigslist, right? Like it's the technology that allows us to build these platforms to get work done more efficiently, right? Because it's cheaper, but it's cheaper labor, and so it's more dangerous in that the employee, the person that's performing that labor, is the person that's incurring all of the risk. Um, the other sort of piece of technology that I thought about in preparing for this, this evening um, was like Uber, right? Uber replaced taxi cabs. Because we're here at Center Stage tonight, I had to take it back to Jitney, right? August Wilson that debuted like 1982, so was that 40 years ago? What impact does that have, right? August Wilson couldn't have wrote Jitney if Ubers existed, right? Uber, excuse me, Jitneys were created because of, uh, in the play at least, um, taxis wouldn't drive to this one particular neighborhood, right? So the impact, I think of it in this way that a Jitney was communal technology, right? It didn't have the app behind it like Uber, but it was a communal technology. It was a communal response to a sort of wall that racism created for folks, right? The folks in Jitney were dealing and sort of battling with post-Vietnam war industrialization, incarceration, not being able to find jobs, and so they were able to pool their resources and sort of collectivize to maintain jobs. The next sort of tidbit and nugget that I started contemplating uh, in preparation for this evening is the environment. Just go with me on this journey, though. We consider in large part that the United States education system prepares in large part our young people for jobs in the service industry, right? And those are primarily location-based. That's one piece. The next piece is the pathway, the trajectory that we're on when it comes to natural disaster and whether or not you believe those natural disasters to be organic or influenced by human behavior. <laughs> Just consider the impact that environmental racism, if we wanna call it that, has on marginalized communities and the role that that plays, right? When I mentioned that I lived down in New Orleans and I had the wild experience of having to evacuate for not Katrina, but Hurricane Gustav. And this is when, in between working at the Amistad Research Center and working at the Neighborhood Gallery, I was waiting tables on Bourbon Street. They have something in New Orleans that's called Blackout Days, right? In the month of August, you cannot take a day off. It's the busiest time of the year. Nobody is getting a day off. You are going to be on, waiting these tables. You're not going anywhere, right? Gustav is predicted to come. You get, you know, you know when a hurricane is coming, right? In, in this part of the country, it will be snow, so we'll be preparing for a blizzard, right? But in that part, it's water. It's going to be a lot of rain. It's going to be a hurricane. Oh, not a big deal. No big deal. Seven days out. Five days out. Four days out. And I'm like, this is causing me a lot of alarm, right? I'm from here, I'm like, I haven't seen this much water that I couldn't move with a shovel. I'm on, I'm on high alert here in New Orleans. And I'm like, why is there no evacuation? And it's because it will cost a lot of money to be able to shut down this major service-based industry and say, we're gonna pay you to not be here 
to leave to evacuate, right? So I remember a lot, all of the criticism and critiques about Hurricane Katrina. Why didn't people just leave? What was the big deal? And I'm like, if you work at a service-based job in the month of August when Hurricane Katrina hit, you can't take off. You have to wait literally until the state de declares a state of emergency in order for you to be able to evacuate. So think about that in terms of the role that environmental or natural disasters are gonna have on a labor industry, right? We see that, we've already seen that. I think we're gonna to continue to see that. Another sort of just rumination that I had is, uh, especially related to micro businesses, a lot of the entrepreneurs I serve are bakers, right? They're chefs, they're people that cook. And I learned, about, I'm like, why is the cost of, I'm also a baker, why is the cost of vanilla so expensive? expensive? Any, okay, but you know, you, that we had a, okay, you get it. The best vanilla in the world comes from a very tiny place called Madagascar, right? That tends to be outrageously impacted by cyclones of all natural disasters, but not just cyclones, also because of the way that the land is kept, right? So cyclones plus poor land use means when her, or excuse me, when cyclones come through, it disrupts the growth of this vanilla, right? Something that's all the way in Madagascar, what implication does that have in Baltimore for the cost of a vanilla bean cupcake, right? So I'm, I'm saying this and bringing these pieces up because I think for me what came to the top when I contemplated the future of labor is really how incredibly closely related we all are. Everything is interconnected. The last piece that I kind of wanted to talk about is the impact that the tenets of white supremacy have on really all of these pieces, labor, the history of labor in this country, and when we talk about the enslavement of African people, um, the pressure that it puts on technology, the forced natural disasters, the disruption and the mistreatment of our planet when it comes to white supremacy. The specific tenets that I'm referring to are fear, urgency, individualism and this sort of progress and quantity versus quality. When you put all of those things together, what does that mean, right? Individualism, to me, is this concept that if I personally pull myself up by my bootstraps, I get enough side gigs on Fiverr that I can figure this out, I don't need a labor union, I can, I can figure this out on my own, right? When I think about this sense of urgency, right, we talk about I don't know if you all are aware of like fracking, any level of environmental injustice that's taking place in our country. It's a sense of urgency and it's a, a sense of scarcity, a sense of fear that forces us to think that it's gonna be worth it in the short term to mistreat our planet and not have to reap the consequences right in the long term. So what does that mean, right? We are in large part, not necessarily us in this room, but the powers that be, are oftentimes largely focused on short-term gains, right? And I, I believe that when we sort of peel back the layers, that is all of those pieces are sort of rooted in the tenets of white supremacy. And so I think it would be really easy to think about what is terrifying about the future of labor, but I really want to kind of just pause there and ask what excites you about the future of labor, right? Like there's some very scary things about what's on the horizon but I really wanna add, open up and sort of just ask you, what possibilities do you see? I'll start by just kind of sharing one for me. When I think about technology, I think about envir the environment. I think there's incredible opportunity for what's considered like hybrid or sort of micro industries, right? So what does it look like for us to create weather resistant technology, right? If we have more weather systems, if climate change is really projected and it, it manifests in the way that it's being projected, there's gonna be more precipitation in the air, right? So do we all need like rain boots 365 days? Do we all need like smart rain jackets to be like, what does that look like really? And I'm like, are there jobs that can be created as a result of some of the problems that we know are on the horizon? Are there ways for us to be proactive about that? So I'm gonna pause there and I really wanna ask, I'm curious what your thoughts are about the future of labor? Is anything that if you want to talk about the terrifying part, I welcome that as well. But I also want to hear about like, what are the parts that excite you? Where are the opportunities that you think we have in this country, specifically in Baltimore, um, for growth? I'm curious. So I don't have like the greatest answer, but what I like about that question 
is the challenge. Um, as a writer, I believe we are the first innovators, right? I think that creative writers imagine first. Word. And then the, the world of technology responds and tries to bring to fruition the things that we imagined. Mm -hmm. And so every time I see a new advancement, it's just a, it's another writer's dream being brought to life. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really curious of how many writer's dreams will be manifested. And so I just add that to the, to the conversation. Um, I'm just curious to see how much science and technology and sci-fi that we've all once upon just, it was just all a writer's Imagine, idea. Yeah. Um, and to some engineers, you know, new, new advancement. Um, I don't have the cure to all the ails of the world. <laughs> but, Me either. But I think, um, the pandemic showed us that where labor is concerned, um, when people were losing jobs, people discovered that, a lot of us discovered that we had different talents and skills that we could create our own jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned vanilla, I'm a baker also. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I've started making my own vanilla. You only need two ingredients. Um, and so I, I just think with the pandemic, we all learned that we've got skills and uh, abilities that we can kind of create our own way in life, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so just on that kind of small scale, uh, I think the whole uh, future of labor um, is ending up being a little bit individualistic. We've learned that we can work from home. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to go into the office every day. Um, I know I was more productive at home because I didn't have all the, inter the interruptions with phone calls and people walking in and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, one thought I have is the future is obviously going to be more AI. Like he said all these great poems and we all clapped and we all felt <laughs> right? something from them, but they were all AI. So I wonder with the future being now more technology and how does that come into this community to people like school, like our school is barely funded, right? I doubt they're going to be teaching coding here. What, how do we integrate that and bring those two together so that, you know, we're still in the curve of this technology and what it's going to be? You know, am I making sense? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. I think it's just, oh, sorry, yeah. Wow. Ah. There, you are. there we go. It's me. Um, you know, something I'm thinking about a lot in conjecture with, you know, making your own vanilla is how do we incentivize the labor outside of our jobs that contributes so much to the world that we operate in? How do we incentivize making your own vanilla? How do we incentivize planting trees in your street? How do we incentivize recycling when you're not a, a member of the, like, you know, city's recycling team, you know? Mm -hmm. What are the ways in which we can incentivize all community um, action uh, in ways that robots won't be able to? Yeah. Absolutely. I think the major, one of the major questions that we have to contemplate is how we will distinguish, I guess, human beings, what we will determine is considered skilled versus unskilled labor, right? I think it's a lot of conversation about AI taking away unskilled jobs, um, but there are just certain jobs that we still consider unskilled, right? They're not as favorable, I, when, especially when I think about um, like our healthcare workers, caregivers especially, right? Those are jobs that are not necessarily prized, but there's no way for a robot to replace a care. I don't know about y'all, I don't want a robot you know what I mean? Should I ever get into that situation, I would not want a robot doing that. So for me, I'm like, there's still, and what does that mean, right? What, were, what are we going to be willing to give up in exchange for all of us to have jobs with living wages? The other question that I would pose is just like, will you be a member, to our stage manager's question, will you be a member of a food co-op or a mutual aid society, right? If and when, right? AI is, I think it has a lot of benefits as a lot of potential to, for us to leverage it in ways that benefit humanity, right? Rather than destroy and sort of erode it. But if and when power grids go down, right? Like 
and I think to your point, right, COVID showed us, it, it, ex, it exposed a lot of pieces um, and a lot of sort of brokenness in our systems, right? So what will it look like if we don't have access to those power grids, if AI is built beautifully and wonderfully and there's no bad robots, so to speak, what will it mean for us to still not have access to power, um, electricity rather, and have to sort of fall back on whatever those systems are, right? So, and then the other question is, I haven't heard anyone that's even other than the, the reading that you read to really talk about like the role that rest will play in the future of labor and where and how we're going to situate that. I grew up with the understanding that work was supposed to be hard. You needed to sort of feel it. And I'm really trying as best I can to lean more into the soft life. I don't know if anybody else is, but it requires, yes, yeah, soft life. So what is that, what, what, are, what are we going to have to give up in order to get there, right? We're not necessarily going to snap our fingers and get to the soft life. It's going to require a level of coordination if it's not just going to be a select number of us that have a soft life and then everyone else is um, forced to have, right, to, to have that back-breaking labor that, uh, at least for me, my ancestors contributed to in the building of this country. So... Those are just some of my thoughts. I have a bunch of questions if anybody else wants to to, to uh, ponder with me. I'll ponder. Yeah. I mean, I'm just really curious. Like, what, when you think about what your future will look like, like, have you daydreamed it in a way that is not extractive? You know, do you, what do you think about in terms of your own future? Like, what will that look like in 20 years from now? In 20 years from now, I have not thought of. I'm still trying to think of the next five. Respect. <laughs> Respect. Like, I respect it. Day by day. Truly. Um, 20, 2040. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what I think that would look like, what I'd be doing, what the industries may look like. As you said before, like, um, black communities, they're more on, like, the service industry. And, like, um, I feel like they're also in the entertainment more industries. So I forgot where going with that point. That's all good. <laughs> well, I think you ended there. I was just say that, like I said, related to education, the impact that we are, in lots of ways, I think oftentimes, not all, and I don't mean this to say it in a um, totally all-encompassing way, but in large part, we are grooming, I think, our children to work service-based jobs, right? And oftentimes, they're not being supplemented with opportunities for art, theater, right, to come and engage other parts of their brain so that we're not just focused on the service and this sort of transaction that we can provide in exchange for resources to be able to take care of ourselves. Um, so that's it, those are my thoughts on labor. Kenneth got his hand raised. So very briefly, I think about the next 20 years, it is something that as of January, I, for the first time, I thought about that question. Mm. And I looked at my savings account. So I've been a nonprofit industrial system, complex system. <laughs> For, for 20 years it's almost. And um, after 20 years of working in, quote unquote, the world of social justice, addressing social justice issues, as a social justice, in the education and just, no, all the poverty, drug abuse, whatever issue I could, I could work towards in pursuit of making the world a better place. Mm. After 20 years of that almost, I looked at my savings and saw like $80 in there. And I thought to myself, the next 20 years can't look like this. Right, what does that mean for me if 20 years from now after me quote unquote working so tirelessly for 50, 60 hours a week in hopes the world will be better, what does that mean for me? And it meant that I had to figure out a way to leave this industry. I, I mm. could not focus on saving the world anymore because the world was not gonna save me in return, right? And, um, and so now it has drastically changed and shaped every decision I make moving forward because I'm desperately knowing at the end of the next 20 years, I am playing catch up mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that you no know, 60 year old me is taken care of because I can't trust this, you know, anything else to do that. So th the answer to that is I personally imagine me living in a different country where the cost of living is much lower. So whatever I save, from now and then mm -hmm. can actually take care of me there. And so somewhere where there's tree, where there's fruit on trees, I know that, <laughs> and it's gonna be a different country, that's for sure. Yep. So I, I'm gonna stop there, and I, I guess the, so my sort of final thoughts, and it's a, 
another very corny connection to the railroad, but this is not, in my opinion, I feel like I'm an eternal optimist. I don't feel like this is a sort of nonstop locomotive. I feel like the trajectory that we're on related to education, environment, um, labor specifically, late, the way that labor impacts access to housing, the way that housing impacts safety, the way, you know, all of those pieces. Um, I think we have the, the opportunity to sort of stop and reassemble some of those pieces. So I guess if, if anything, I would like to just sort of leave you with uh, the opportunity to kind of ponder what labor for you is gonna look like in the next 20 years um, and what you are going to be leaving behind. Um, specifically, the, the instruction to care for one another that you're gonna be leaving behind to other people, right? To Ken's point, how are we going to be able to take care of our futures? And I feel like some of that work is now. Um, and I think a huge part of it is, is the ways that we are being more compassionate with one another, making space, asking for help, collaborating, um, and working together. That's it. Yes. Thank y'all. Working together, yes, <laughs> keep it up. Thank you, Bakari. Thank, thank you so much for your wisdom. And thank you all for being so vulnerable and talking with us and actually like sharing your thoughts and your visions. If I could be so vulnerable, where I see myself in the next 20 years is really just planting tomatoes on an earth ship with everyone I really, really like. And there's birds and there's songs. Speaking of songs, though, see what I did there? No. I want to bring <laughs> Radical Evolution up to close us out um, with our final song of the evening. Yeah? Yeah, you guys want to come up to the stage? Wonderful. And I'm wondering, too, um, as you guys get settled, if you could just introduce yourselves, yeah. name, what you do, where we could find you. Yeah, why don't we start, Mal? And, From me? And, and say a little bit, too, about like what your involvement with the show is, too. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh -huh. And what you... No, no, play music. I'll play music, okay. So, hello. Um, my full name is Xiao Qing Zhang, but you could call me Mao. That's my nickname, and then that's, you know, what everybody else or my equity name is. I, um, I came from Beijing, China, but I was born in Jiangsu province, which is the province next to Shanghai. Um, yeah, I enjoy, grow up in the countryside. Um, yeah, flying kites. Um, and the one day, just dreaming of, you know, I was studying folk music. That's where I, you know, the original training came from, uh, different kind of Chinese folk songs. I, I'm really interested in those. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I feel like that's very interesting for our show, that we can bring all these kind of uh, unique folk music into the show. Mm -hmm. um, including different kind of styles. We have blues, we have country, different kind of country music. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, one day I just fell in love in, um, for a musical, and then I decided I want to be on Broadway. And then, <laughs> you know, I just started to audition for the school first in China, and then we did some musical theater program, and afterwards I performed like three years in China for, as a leading lady in China. <laughs> For some, some, for some good, uh, for some good shows, um, and then I, you know, came here for a scholar with scholarship, um, and then for a master degree, and then I just uh, wander around New York and meet these guys eventually. <laughs> 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 so that's my experience. Um, for this show, I think it's very in, uh, inspiring and special for me because um, both of them, they actually allow me to express who I am. And uh, they also encouraged me to actually play one of the folk, mus uh, folk instrument from China, mm -hmm. which at that time, when, before we played the show, I've actually never touched, mm. our, which is Arhu, which is two strings. I didn't bring it today. We couldn't bring it out. Yeah, it was two string, but I, I somehow bought it from China, I thought for like, just for, sh you know, props. Mm. Um, but, Julian one day just said, Mao, what other instrument do you play? I said, well, Arhu, I, I barely play, but I have that instrument. He said, bring it. So actually, during the rehearsal, I developed and we experiment. Um, so um, now I can play good Arhu as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was really special experience because usually Arhu just play with some traditional tones, but we actually mash up with different kind of 
instrument from mm -hmm. all over the world. So it creates some very special sound. Um, so yeah, according to some of the Chinese Asian audiences, they think it was a great, great experience for them. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it was. Um, sorry, I'm Julian uh, Mesri. Uh, I'm a music director and arranger uh, for Songs About Trains and, and for a lot of Rag Revolution's work. Um, I am also a composer and a playwright. Um, the instruments you heard me play, uh, so there was a guitar, which is Nashville tuning, so it's kind of got some fun sort of bluegrass elements to it. And then uh, this is called a Woodrow. It's basically an Appalachian dulcimer, which is made uh, by, I would consider it a micro business uh, in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, they're really cool uh, and very easy to play. They're very fun instruments. Um, and then the other guitar I was playing was a charango, um, which I bought down the street from my grandmother's house in Buenos Aires. And I was like, uh, it's usually, you know, like Ma was saying about the Arhu, uh, the charango is a uh, originally a Andean uh, folk instrument uh, that is kind of brought around during the time of sort of colonialism and kind of a mashup between indigenous instruments and sort of Spanish lutes. Um, and even to this day is kind of used all over. And so just like Ma said with the Arhu, we're kind of using it in Songs About Trains. Definitely not the way it was originally <laughs> used. I don't think we play, I don't think there was any Andean, uh, you know, builders of the railroads. Um, and, you know, in, in my other life, I am, yeah, I am a composer, a playwright, um, currently working on an adaptation of Comedy of Airs uh, over uh, at the public theater, and it's going to be in English and Spanish. Um, that's something I find very important, is the, the bringing in of multiple languages and styles uh, within the tradition of musical theater, and that's something that is very important to songs about trains. Is you you will have heard three languages in this mm -hmm. today, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. English, uh, Spanish, Spanish, and, and Mandarin. Mandarin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cantonese, awesome. Actually, uh, uh, Cantonese. Yeah, I was Cantonese, Cantonese. Not Mandarin. Yes. Yeah, Cantonese. Um, before I announce myself, I think it's only right that I acknowledge um, our collaborators who are not in the room yes. who you don't see. Uh, one of which would be our amazing director in crime, uh, Rebecca Martinez. Rebecca! Um, who directed a show here maybe four years ago. The, Miss You Like the, Hell. Is, Miss You Like Hell. Yeah. She was director for that. Um, and then my partner in life and in all things art, Maropi Peponides, if you're watching, I love you, babe. Um, <laughs> who is all the amazing things uh, that are connected to this show and make everything about Radical Evolution possible, really. Um, so uh, my name is Beto uh, O'Byrne. Beto is an Alberto from my father's side. The family's from Mexico and, and Texas. And O'Byrne from my, uh, my, the other side of my family, which is uh, of Irish stock, and that is where I learned this instrument right here, which is the Irish bow ram. Uh, it's a frame drum, like most cultures have some variation of the frame drum. This is the Irish version of it. Um, and we'll play the song in two seconds, but I just want to say it is May Day, which is International Workers' Day. And the thing about International Workers' Day is really beautiful. If you don't know the International Workers' Song, the Internationale, it ends with the international ideal where you unite the human race and the idea of solidarity, which is so important and so important to this show and something that I think about that is something that is necessary for anything for, that we want to do, that we have to unite, that we have to create solidarity with one another, especially when we're different, right? Like that's when it's the most important. And I think about that a lot when I play this song um, because it is a song that comes from the Irish tradition and it was similar to Mao. I learned the Bauran through my work in theater and I learned it by playing songs like this one. And I spent most of my career working in and around the Chicano theater, around the Mexican American theater and celebrating that part of myself and didn't really spend that much time thinking about the Irish side of myself until the last couple of years. And it was through playing this instrument and through playing Songs About Trains and another show that we were working on, I started understanding it and I started understanding the history of Irish Americans in this country and how there was a time, for example, when the Irish were not considered part of, of white people, right? The Irish people were not white. And this song actually comes from that time. It comes from uh, the, the 1830s when that was true. And something that I talk about when I'm in rooms with other Irish Americans is if we know that history, if Irish Americans understand that, then we understand who we should be in solidarity with. Mm. We understand who that is, right? And it's people in this room, it's other workers, it's the people that built this wall right here, the concrete in this wall, and put it in there. 
and um, that's really important, and I think about it a lot when I play this song. So thank you all so much. Well, in 1841, my corduroy breeches I put on. My corduroy breeches I put on to work upon the railway, the railway. I'm weary of the railway. works on the railway. Well, in 1845, I'd rather be dead than alive. I'd rather be dead than alive to work upon the railway. I was wearing corduroy breeches, digging ditches, pulling switches, dodging switches. I was working on the railway. Well, in 1847, that's the year I went to heaven. The devil said I was just in time. The devil said I was just in time to work upon the railway. The railway. I'm weary of the railway. works on the railway. And I was wearing corduroy bitches, digging ditches, pulling switches, dodging bitches. I was working on the corduroy bitches, digging ditches, pulling switches, dodging bitches. I was working on the corduroy bitches, digging ditches, pulling switches, dodging bitches. I was working on the corduroy bitches, digging ditches, digging ditches. I was working on the railway. featured artists and our volunteer readers. One more round of applause for our volunteer readers who are joining us. Um, we hope you all had a wonderful time tonight and we look forward to seeing you again at next season's Baltimore Butterfly Sessions. This was the last Baltimore Butterfly Session of this season, but we'll be back for more um, next season, which will start in August, September of this year. Um, in the meantime, please check out our website for shows and events happening here at Baltimore Center Stage. We have a show called Life is a Dream that will start previews next week. It is a limited run, so please make sure you get your tickets soon. And we've got a whole weekend of activities for all generations on um, May 13th and 14th. That whole weekend is called Sueños y Reflexiones. Um, and we please check out the website for all the details around everything that's happening that weekend. It is all free. Um, so please, please do come back. Um, and until then, we again hope you had a great evening. And oh, I was told to tell you the bar is still open if anyone wants a final drink, and then we're gonna shut the bar down. So you're welcome to uh, like hang out in the lobby and continue talking and be in fellowship tonight. Thank you again so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks.